Great, Steve. Thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate that, and and you know, you, you warm my heart as a business dean, right? It, it's talking about profitability. It's talking about that tip jar. So really appreciate uh, you sharing your perspective, and congratulations on uh, on the innovation that that you and your your team at Astrosat has uh, has gotten. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, so um, I'm I'm now pleased to to welcome our panelists. Um, as we as we move into the next section of our um, of our session today, and um, as as we do this, what I'd like to do is introduce each panelist. I'll ask them to share a few words, say ten minutes or so, um, about their perspective on creating the space economy. And after we've introduced each of the four panelists and they've they've spoken. We're going to turn to a true panel discussion here um, and, and question and answer session. Uh, and, and those who are participating today in the audience, this is where I'd like to ask your participation by um, putting in the Q&A uh, questions for each of our panelists. And we'll try to get to as many questions uh, as we possibly can today. So we're going to start with Dr. Dan Rasky um, from the NASA Space Portal Office. Uh, Dr. Dan Rasky uh, is a NASA senior scientist, was co-founder of the Space Portal Office in 2005, and is the current chief of the Space Portal Office. Rasky was the primary inventor or significant contributor to flight hardware for 10 NASA and U.S. flight systems, which includes the Space Shuttle, the DCXA, Sharp B-1 and B-2, Mars Pathfinder, DS-2, Mars Exploration Rovers, Stardust Mission, and the Reentry Breakup Recorder, um, the, the Mars Science Laboratory, and the X-37. From 2005 through 2006, Rasky was a core member of the NASA HQ team, which established the successful NASA COTS program. From 2008 to 2009, Rasky worked with SpaceX to develop the thermal protection systems for their Dragon capsule. Uh, Dan, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jason. And I think I have a couple of charts. Are you guys going to show those or? Okay. Um, again, my my props. And uh, so, if you go to the, you can go to the next slide, please. I wanted to give a little bit of history, uh, both the the space portal and some of our roles and. This was our, our first national workshop that we ran in the summer of, uh, of 2005. And this is when uh, uh, Mike Griffin had just become NASA administrator. He started in April, and this was in June. And the title, A New Entrepreneurial Paradigm for the International Space Station, when I look at this now, I just have to chuckle. Um, and I still remember uh, uh, Dr. Griffin when he saw this, because he had to approve this as a NASA administrator before he went forward, his first comment was entrepreneurial and ISS are two terms he never thought he'd see in the same sentence. And uh, what we did with this workshop is the first time, uh, to our knowledge, we brought together the groups that were interested in supply, demand, and capital relative to LEO uh, capabilities, and particularly ISS. And if you go to the next slide, this was a very good discussion. Um, a number of, of good activities came out, and there was a company that was formed. NanoRacks actually was formed out of this workshop when a question was raised, why is it so difficult to get payloads onto the ISS? And a couple of folks in attendance said, we know how to do this, and they formed NanoRacks, and NanoRacks continues to do very well. Next slide, please. Our next workshop then actually was two years later, um, and this was then sponsored by Mark Uran um, out of NASA headquarters, and this was actually the unveiling of the ISS National Lab. So by that time, uh, Mike Griffin and company had been looking at what are we going to do with ISS, how do we enable more commercial engagement and support, and the ISS National Lab uh, was the result. Next slide, please. And this is essentially where the ISS National Lab was born, okay? And that was rolled out shortly after this workshop. Next slide, please. 
And I'm going to just go through this very quickly. The ISS is doing very well today. Christine is actually going to um, go into more details on what is going on, uh, the activities of the ISS National Lab um, today. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm just going to track through these. A lot of stuff going on. Next slide, please. And then one more. The other activity that we had a really big hand in uh, was the COTS program, the Com Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, which also came in to play at the start of uh, Dr. Griffin's tenure as NASA Administrator in the 2005-2006 timeframe. And the this was looking at solving a problem for NASA. And the problem was with the ISS flying and with the space shuttle scheduled to be decommissioned, which it was at that time because we had had Columbia. So we had Challenger, then Columbia. And after Columbia, the decision was, okay, we're going to decommission the shuttle. Well, we had ISS flying. Well, how do we provide both cargo and crew transports you know, capabilities for the ISS. And the COTS program was NASA's response to that. And this was, next slide, please. The, this was a really innovative program. In fact, we were working with AVC, uh, Alan Marty, and who helped us put in place a very uh, innovative approach for uh, companies that were interested to demonstrate their capabilities to get payload to the ISS, and we were even hoping to, to get crew at some point. And then this tracked along with another really critical program, the Commercial Resupply Services Program, which was essentially the service contract from NASA in the billions of dollar range to actually provide cargo services to the ISS. And these two programs, actually, next slide, please. These two programs um, were essential into the success of the COTS program, which stood up two new rockets, the Falcon 9 and the Antares, and um, uh, uh, cargo capabilities, which were the Dragon capsule for SpaceX and the Falcon 9, and then the Cygnus uh, spacecraft for, at that time, Orbital Sciences and Antares. So we had two new space transportation systems for cargo that came out of the COT CRS program. So a big win. Next slide, please. And now, okay, we obviously have a SpaceX Falcon 9, and Elon's shown that he can, you know, reuse his boosters and cut his costs at least, and he can still make a nice profit on top of that. And there are two other offerings uh, that are looking to, you know, their debut this year, the ULA Vulcan, an upgrade of the Atlas V, uh, which they're intending to fly this year, and then the Blue Origin New Glenn, which right now looks like it's going to be at least 2022 before it flies. But again, but two new offerings for low-cost space access. So uh, that this is continuing. Next slide, please. And then we get to the real outlier uh, Starship uh, that Elon is pursuing. And in that one uh, picture at the bottom left, uh, there's actually a uh, Falcon 1, uh, the first thing, the first rocket that Elon uh, cut his teeth on, and then uh, Starship, actually, that's the uh, the the Mark 1 that uh, actually never passes pressurization, but you can see the scale differences between that. Next slide. And if SpaceX is successful with their Starship development, which is a big if. I would put right now their odds at at least 50-50, if not better, based on kind of where things are at right now. It could be a really big game changer for very low cost space access. And so this may open the door to a whole host of space activities that right now can't afford to ride even on the Falcon 9 or, or some of these other uh, traditional or traditional rockets. Next slide, please. But in, here's a key question, and uh, what are all the payloads that will fill up this launch capacity? In addition to these rockets that I've just laid out, there's a whole slew of small launchers that are being put on the table, including Electron Rocket and Astra, and there's a whole range of other ones. Next slide, please. And Elon, being Elon, of course, he has his 
own um, suggestion or solution for payloads. He's just going to do his own. Okay, Starlink. Next slide. And right now they have over 1,200 spacecraft on orbit. I think it's 1,261 when I looked. And here's an assessment by, by Forbes. According to our analysis, we estimate that Starlink could be worth about $30 billion, with a B, by 2025, assuming it generates revenues of $10.4 billion over a range of time. And this is Forbes, okay? So this is not Elon. This is Forbes making that assessment. Next slide. And then there's a spate of uh, space SPACs, which is a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, and that's the Special Purpose Acquisition Corporations, a reverse merger. And let me go, go to the next slide, but it's a interesting um, financing technique. But look at some of these recent valuations, which we found jaw-dropping. Rocket Lab, uh, $4.1 billion. Spire. By the way, Spire started from our offices, our space portal offices, Peter Platzer and, and company in the summer of 2012. And there's a whole story there. Now, Little Spire, or what was Little Spire, 1.6 billion. Black Sky, another Earth observation company, uh, 1.5 billion. And then Astrospace, again, a dedicated small launcher, 2.1 billion. I mean, these are really huge valuations. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is a really a question is, can this continue or is this a bubble ready to burst? But it shows the level, I think, of investor interest now in getting, you know, an investment stake in the in the commercial space industry. Next slide. And uh, one more, please. So in our view, OK, from the the years we've been involved with this. Commercial space continues to develop capabilities, space resources, and identify markets and customers. We've just seen this grow, you know, now exponentially from when we got started way back in 2005. Next slide. We believe it's going to play a larger and larger role in space development going into the future because there's just so many resources and talent and ideas and capabilities uh, coming into this area. Next slide. But the continuing question, and we have been searching for this and others as well, what will be the principal future markets and payloads for space? And we have some of our own ideas, and I know Elon does, Jeff Bezos does, but uh, we will see, and I think that's really the outstanding question going forward for business viability and even government investment. So I will leave it with that. Thank you, Jason.